space for what we're going to do together today and just wanted you all to take a quick minute and think about a product or service that you've engaged with um, since we've been doing COVID that has really sort of helped you make it through? What's something where the experience of it has really uh, helped you tremendously? Sneak peek into mine. Mine would be Peloton. Um, so I, I don't know what I would have done without a Peloton over the last little bit. But if you all will just think through it, um, and as it comes to you, a product or service that you really enjoyed engaging with, maybe drop some of them in the chat. Um, help me out and get the chat started and put some of those products or services that you really enjoyed using in the chat. Um, and I'll wait for a couple of those to percolate up. Nice, we have it happen. Instacart so far rising to the top. TikTok, books. Nice. Daily devotionals and chocolate, I like it. This is a, is a great list. Grocery pickup. So the reason I wanted to get us started thinking about a product or service that you've engaged with that's really made the difference for you is that if you think about products and services where you have this experience with them, where it's easy, uh, where it's enjoyable, where you want to repeat it over and over again, where it keeps you, you know, engaged, those products and services are using human-centered design in their development. I, I guarantee it. So, you know, when people talk about how much they love their iPhone or their, you know, their AirPods or whatever it is that people use in their day-to-day -day life that they really enjoy, the companies that are behind those are absolutely using human-centered design. And what's been really interesting and in the work that we've been doing at the Da Vinci Center is you know, the, the work of the Da Vinci Center at BCU, we're a cross-disciplinary hub. So we serve arts, business, engineering, the humanities and sciences, and the health sciences at BCU. So incredibly cross-disciplinary in nature. But the common language that we all speak across this is definitely human-centered design. And we do a number of industry-sponsored projects. And what's always so interesting for me is that you know, whether we are working for Pfizer or CarMax or Capital One or any of these Fortune 500 companies, these same principles come into play time and time again. And yet when we work with other organizations, so we also work with the YMCA of Greater Richmond, we work with other nonprofit partners, there's a huge knowledge gap oftentimes between the methodologies that are being used by some of these leading companies that are developing innovative product and a lot of our social services, nonprofits, government, you know, regional economic development groups. And, and, and what I'm hoping we can do today is start to close that gap a little bit through an introduction to human-centered design and give you some tools that you can implement immediately in your own work that will start to, to make rapid gains in that space. Because one of the biggest differences is the speed at which you can pivot and make change when you're using human-centered design and design thinking. And I know what some of you are going to say. You're going to say, you know, but this is a highly regulated bureaucratic environment. Um, and I would agree with that, that the government absolutely can be those things. But we are seeing this deployed incredibly successfully in other highly regulated, highly bureaucratic environments like healthcare and finance. Um, so I'm going to bring in some examples of other highly, uh, you know, large organizations uh, with lots of policies, procedures, and rules and ways that we're still using human-centered design to make gains. Um, particularly, we've done a lot of work in healthcare since COVID where it became really apparent that we couldn't do our traditional process in how we were going to respond to COVID from a healthcare perspective. We needed some new tools. And so I'm gonna give some specific examples of what we actually did in response to the pandemic um, using these skill sets. So um, again, just a little bit of a refresher. I'm Garrett Westlake. Uh, Executive Director of the Da Vinci Center at VCU. I've been in Richmond, Virginia for five years now. Prior to coming to VCU, I served as the Associate Dean for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Arizona State University um, and really had the opportunity there to, you know, at the nation's largest public research university, understand ecosystem development um, and how we can foster communities of innovation. And so super excited to be um, here in Richmond, bringing that to our local community. And at the Da Vinci Center, we teach at the undergraduate and graduate level. So we teach product innovation, venture creation, and design thinking um, at the undergraduate and graduate levels, as well as healthcare innovation at the graduate level. 
So today I, I want to start with a great story um, of what innovation looks like in some other sectors. And, and this one is interesting. We get a chance to work with a lot of great partners. And I got a chance to work with the innovation team at Chobani. Um, and you know, this was this is a softball question, but if I asked you what kind of company Chobani is, why don't you throw it in the chat? So if I said, what kind of company is Chobani? Um, what would you all say? Go ahead and answer in the chat. Right there, yogurt company. Um, we, we, we all know this. I think if we were gonna be really avant-garde about what kind of company Chobani was, we might say that they were a food tech company, right? Everything's a tech company these days, right? They're, they're a food tech company, but they're a yogurt company. All right, so this next question is a little bit harder. If I asked you what the latest product was coming out of Chobani, what do you think the newest product that Chobani is launching is? Coffee creamers. I like that one. It's not it though. All natural yogurt, oatmeal yogurt. Keep going, no one's got it yet. Cereal, vegan. Yogurt sunblock, vaccinated yogurt. Awesome, you guys are good. Um, so the person that's the closest um, and still not close at all is the yogurt sunblock. That, that, that one wins, I think, so far this, this afternoon. The newest product that Giovanni is launching is a capsule clothing line. And now I think most of us would be like, wait, they're, they're like a yogurt company. Like they're doing clothing? Like why would a yogurt company develop clothing? And I think this is the difference between what I see as a new economy company in Chobani and an old economy company. And I'm going to give an example of what an old economy company is a little bit later in the presentation. But the, the reason that they are developing a capsule clothing line is because they use design thinking within their organization. And I'll give you how that works. The fundamental building block of human-centered design is what we call a how might we statement, which is meant to open up new possibilities. So instead of when we're faced with a pain point or a problem or a challenge, instead of saying like, oh, how do we fix this? How do we make this better? Like the language, how might we is inspirational, it's future oriented and, and it's engaging. So in this particular example, the chief creative director at Chobani, who I had the great opportunity to meet with was talking about how the creative unit at Chobani was being inundated with requests from other units within the organization to produce all sorts of swag for their salespeople, right? They wanted Chobani hoodies and pants and umbrellas and you name it. And they were like, this is getting crazy. We are spending an enormous amount of money and time designing all of this swag for people within the company. And the, the team, the creative team did a quick design sprint to say, how might we reduce the burden on our creative team for all of this internal swag so that we can focus on the other creative aspects of branding and marketing that we're trying to solve for. And what came out of that was they ran some, of all the ideas they selected, and we're gonna get through how you do those other steps in the process, but this is sort of the, the kitchen example where like it's pre-baked and we just take it out of the oven. So the way they got to the final solution was they came up with this idea that if they hired their own fashion department that just focused exclusively on Chobani clothing. And they sold that clothing to the public. So instead of just making swag and shirts and t-shirts for their own use, if they upped the level of quality and design by hiring a true fashion team within the company, they could sell it on an e-commerce site to the public. And the price per unit would be so much cheaper if instead of buying 10,000, they bought 100,000. And they could sell to the public these products and make revenue that would come back into the organization. So flash forward, Chobani actually successfully did this. They did it first with kids' clothes. And they were able to generate enough money that they were actually projected to cover all of their costs for their own internal use. So this went from being something where the company was spending money to make clothing available for their salespeople to now a new revenue stream to the organization because they weren't afraid to embrace this pivot and this change. And they weren't saying, well, we're a yogurt company. If we're not making yogurt, it's a non-starter, right? And there are plenty of examples where we're like, well, this is what we do. So that's how we have to do it. 
even though you might be missing an opportunity to both solve an internal pain point and now they have this new revenue stream and, and other forms of customer engagement. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about six basically building block steps of design thinking. The first one I mentioned is how might we statements. And what I think you want to think about when you think about a how might we statement is you're really thinking about wanting to fall in love with a problem. So too often in this process, we are faced with a challenge and we come up with a solution, right? Either by ourselves or our teams. And we're like, this is a great solution. We fall in love with that solution. And we think it's a great idea because we came up with it. And so we keep pursuing that solution instead of being hyper-focused on the problem we're trying to solve. Because if you remain really focused and excited about the problem, you keep coming, you, you persevere in pursuit of a solution that really solves that problem versus falling in love with a solution where you say, well, I guess we'll just roll with it. And so what that looks like in practice is I, part of my job is listening to pitches, right? So at Arizona State, I ran the university's accelerator program in a, in a past life as well. I ran a technology startup company. I've raised venture capital. And what I always strikes me about this is the companies that get funding are the ones that understand their problem better than the competition. They don't necessarily have a better product. They typically do, but that better product is not because of design or engineering. It's because they understand the problem. And I'll give you an example from Tesla. Tesla, I don't know how many of you saw last year when they announced their Cybertruck and they rolled out this new electric truck and everyone made fun of the way it looked and this, that, and the other. There was a really incredible feature though, when you look at the Cybertruck and it built into the tailgate of the Cybertruck was a telescoping ramp, right? So you can flip down the tailgate of the Cybertruck from Tesla and out slides a full length, full size sheet of metal. You can drive an ATV into it. You can roll a dolly up into it and it's embedded in the back of a truck. And I saw that and I thought to myself, we have been making pickup trucks in the United States for more than a hundred years and no one thought to put a ramp in it, right? Like, why is that? Like, why did, like, most people use a truck for hauling things. Like, that is the pain point. People have trucks for other reasons, but the majority of trucks are used to, I don't care whether you're going to Home Depot once a month to get mulch for your household or whether you're a contractor, trucks are used to haul things. And if you really understand the problem of what people are using a truck to solve for, you would realize you should make it as easy as possible to get things in and out of the back of a truck. And yet this whole industry didn't do it for a hundred years. And people are like, oh, that looks ridiculous. That looks silly. I guarantee you then, you know, Tesla had what, 600,000 pre-orders in the first couple months after launch. Those little features, they understood the human end user and their pain point. They observed people, they watched people. We had this great experience about understanding users. And this is, so I'm gonna jump to the next one. So the first one is how might we statements? How might we better help individuals that need to haul things, right? If we are building a pickup truck, how might we design a vehicle that meets the needs of users trying to move large amounts of objects, messy objects, all of that, right? We eventually down the road through these next steps get to a ramp among other features. The second one is the next mistake we tend to make is when we start thinking about users of our products, of our services, of, of what we produce in our work, we always want to norm it. We think about the average user. Well, average users produce average solutions. They are not particularly enlightened. They are not inspiring. You wind up with a pickup truck for a hundred years that looks the exact same and kind of does the same thing. That's what average gets you. In design thinking, and in, especially in human-centered design, we want to find extreme users. We want to look outside the bell curve of users to people on both sides of the spectrum. And what that looks like is people that are um, you know, experts, heavy users in this particular space. And we also want to look at novice users, people that have never engaged with this. So let's use our pickup truck example. You know, instead of going to the average user of a pickup truck and saying, okay, you own a truck, these are your demographics, this is where you live, this is what you do with it. We would go look at a contractor that uses their truck every single day for this extreme purpose and we would look at someone who's never owned a pickup truck. Maybe they don't even drive. And we would look to those two user groups 
to elicit insight about their thoughts on pickup trucks. And that's where we discover these new opportunities. So it's really important that we stay focused on the end user. And another example of what this can look like is we did another project recently for a corporate client. And part of their business is that they send people bills, right? And, and this is a bill we all get every month, by the way. Um, so it's a, imagine a bill that we all get every month. And we ask them, have you ever sat down and watched your customer go through their bill? And like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, how do you know that your bill makes sense to people? They said, well, it has the relevant information, right? It has how many units of XYU, XYU used this month um, and what, what you owe. He said, but have you ever actually taken the time to go on a journey map with this individual, like sit down with them when they open the bill? Ask them questions. Come to find out people didn't understand the bill. They didn't understand what the units meant. They didn't understand where things were laid out, why this section was here, why this was on the back page. There was no thought to customer experience or, an, or a user, right? And so an extreme user would be someone that gets lots of bills. Maybe it's someone actually in business processing that has done this for multiple organizations and different clients and has always been in billing and has seen thousands of billing examples. And maybe it's someone, uh, a, a college freshman that maybe is new to billing and has never gotten a bill before. Those people have really different perspectives and different insights when you start talking to them about the billing process. And so by looking to extreme users, we are able to gain really great insight into a solution that might work for everyone or at least is inspirational. I'll give you another example of something we did. Actually, we'll do it back in the chat. So um, this is a two-part question. Part, so the question is, who do you think is an extreme user of laundry? But this is a trick. We do this all the time. So extreme user of laundry and something I have not heard before in doing these trainings. So try and drop something in the chat on who you think an extreme user would be, either advanced or novice user of laundry that I haven't heard before. Hotels, children, prison, hospitals, someone's teenage son, animal shelters, <laughs> novice my husband, college campus, right? So, these are all great examples of extreme users of laundry. And doing this training the other day, a really great one came up, which was uh, an individual who uses a wheelchair, right? A really great example of an extreme user in this case, also of universal design would be, what is the experience of doing laundry for someone who uses a wheelchair? You know, a top, a really deep top loading washing machine is not going to be accessible to someone that uses a wheelchair, perhaps. But a front-loading washing machine might be accessible to everyone. And by thinking about different individuals and their journey, we can also start to develop more human-centered processes and systems and products. And so this is also where bias can really come into the equation, right? If we had a whole group of white men of similar backgrounds and educational and and you know life opportunity all sitting around designing product which by the way happens um and i think you see this right there's been a there's been a huge movement in the in the beauty space where it was like women of color were basically excluded from most of the major retailers in the cosmetics industry right we had a very you like specific demographic of people designing product for everyone as though everyone looked like and had their needs. And so at this extreme user's perspective, it's really helpful to take on the lens of, okay, this is how I think about who the user might be, but I don't use a wheelchair. What would the experience be like for someone that used a wheelchair? And really start to think through their experience and their journey. And if you can't do that easily in your head, you might need to get out of the building and go talk to people that have very different experiences than your own to really make sure you're exploring all of those in pursuit of solutions. So we have a how might we statement in mind, how might we solve for X? We think about our extreme users for inspiration. Okay, 
Who are my novice users that have never engaged with us before? Who are the extreme users and people that are experts at using this particular product or service? And then we start to identify opportunities, also called brainstorming, right? Um, you know, a couple tips for brainstorming. Some of you may already know this. Research tells us that when it comes to brainstorming, it's really effective to do it on our own first. So I think we think about brainstorming as like we all get in a room together and there are post-it notes. And while that is definitely a part of it, plenty of post-it notes, um, while that's definitely a part of it, you always want to start first. So we always start our brainstorming sessions with a couple minutes of independent quiet work where people on the team independently start writing their own ideas down on individual post-it notes. I'll get to why that's important in a minute. So we do individual brainstorming on post-it notes. And the goal is you want to put a single idea on a post-it note and move on. And all ideas are welcome. The, the best way to have a great idea is to have lots of ideas, right? So you just want to go. It's really impressive when some of these, excuse me, corporate innovation teams come to our office to do this work. Um, they can sit there and just crush through post-it notes. They'll do 10 minutes at a time. And for 10 minutes, the, you know, the pen will not leave the paper. And it's just nonstop idea, 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 idea. And if you find yourself like, how is that even possible? Like I have a couple ideas and then it just kind of goes dry. A couple hints and tips for you. Um, when you're brainstorming, some ways to do this are constraints actually help us be more creative. Um, so if you're trying to come up with new ideas for a pain point, you can think, okay, my next solutions all have to involve an animal. And you have to come up with ideas that all involve animals. Or my next idea has to take place in a car or on the International Space Station, or, and you come up with these really restrictive constraints for yourself, it's really helpful. Or my next idea has to cost at least a million dollars, or my next idea can only cost a dollar. Put these artificial constraints on yourself, and if you create a little cheat sheet for yourself of those, it's actually really easy to come up with new ideas. And you want things like magic is real, unlimited funds, all of these crazy, uh, you know, gravity doesn't exist. All of that is fair game when it comes to brainstorming. Um, and so if you create this environment where you're not bound by the rules of physics or finance or any of these things, um, but simultaneously you put yourself in other boxes when you're trying to do this, you'll find that you can do this. When you do open it up to teams and you start sharing with one another, another tip here is that people stop writing things down so they'll read off their post-it note and they'll say, oh, you know, this is my idea. And someone will be like, oh, I like that. And, and then you have a back and forth and no one's writing them down anymore and you lose some of the best ideas. So always take the time when you're brainstorming to make sure that you're recording those ideas, you're making sure you get them down on paper. Individual post-it notes are helpful because it allows you to move them and code them in the future. The other piece about doing this in real time with others is to keep the positive mindset and the flow of conversation we use a trick called yes and. So when someone says something, you never say, I don't know about that, or that sounds expensive, or really no gravity, or you couldn't do that on the moon. You always want to say yes and. It almost looks like a bad like Saturday Night Live skit in our office when this happens because someone says, you know, we could do this. And someone goes, yes and, yes and, yes. And. But it really helps the conversation keep flowing. It keeps the ideas moving. Um, and if someone starts to be, you know, negative or not constructive, it's helpful just to remind them that we're staying in this yes and space. So we've developed a how might we statement. We have our, we know our extreme users. We've talked to them. We've now started brainstorming with the, now that we know who our extreme users are and we have some context where we have all these ideas. Now, how do we select an idea from there to move forward with, right? This is like where it becomes a little bit you know, art, science, like how do you find that perfect match? And the trick here that I think we tend to, the mistake we make is at this stage of the game, we look at all those ideas and we're like, well, that was a fun exercise, but now we got to get real, right? Like which one can we afford? Which one works on our timeline? And, the, and the, this is the, ki the kiss of death right here. Who else has already done this one? Like, isn't there someone else that has best practices that we can just look to? None of that is helpful. Do none of those things. At this stage of the game, when you are still trying to identify an opportunity, don't restrain yourself on budget, don't restrain yourself on timeline, and don't look for places where it's already been done. Um, we, we find ourselves doing this time and time again, 
And at this stage in this particular process, it's not helpful. And I'll give you another Tesla example. If Tesla had been looking at what the next, what the future of transportation had looked like, you could have looked around and been like, well, GM did an electric car. That didn't go so well for them. I don't know. That doesn't seem like a very good idea. And an electric car that does zero to 60 in under four seconds, like that's that's ludicrous, right? Like an electric car that you know drives itself, like, are you crazy? Like so many parts of a Tesla are things that if we had done them in a brainstorming thing and said, let's pick that idea, people would have been like, that's stupid. That doesn't work. Um, you can't do that. And you look at that trend across SpaceX as well, right? Like a booster rocket that not only you know, is reusable, but lands itself back on a floating platform in the middle of the ocean. Like those things don't happen because organizations say, you know what, I've seen this done before. Let's just do it like they do it. Or, you know what, this sounds pretty cheap and on budget and on timeline. Let's do that. Like those companies do not develop the next service or product that we all like using or are blown away by. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. So at this stage of the game, you want to keep an idea that you select to move forward it needs to be inspirational. It needs to leave you in awe. You don't have all the details worked out. You don't know how it's going to happen, but you know that if it did, it would move the needle in such an outrageous way that it'd be incredible. So keep that in mind. So this is now we're on to the fifth step. This is my favorite. And this is one that I think we absolutely don't do enough of. I know we brainstorm. I know we think about users sometimes in our work, but something we don't do is we don't prototype. And when I say prototype, uh, many of you may be thinking of like Tony Stark and Iron Man and 3D printers and this, that, and the other. And yeah, at the university, we've got 3D printers and laser cutters and all that cool stuff. But when we start prototyping, we do it with cardboard and glue and we make storyboards out of a single sheet of paper. When our students are developing mobile applications, they don't write any code. The first thing they do is they make flip charts and they go and they talk to people and they show them, do you like this screen or do you like this screen? And I'll give you an example from a very recent one. A student literally drew what the home screen would look like on a mobile phone application on a flip chart. And then they showed it to people outside of our student union. This was a year ago, outside of the student union and said, you know, what do you like about this home screen? What would you change? And instantaneously, it was about creating an account for this new online app. And people were like, can't I just log in with Gmail? Can I log in with LinkedIn? Like, why do I have to create a separate login? They hadn't written a single line of code, right? They got all this great feedback that potential users wanted to be able to log in using existing platforms. And that wasn't a change order that had to go back that had to be recoded from the ground up. The product was built with the end user's feedback in mind. And you can make more features available because you spend your money and your resources in such a way that directly match the end user. And you do that through copious amounts of customer interview and iteration on prototypes that cost very little money. I worked with another university. They were trying to solve for, um, they, they were hearing on campus an increased need to address issues of social justice. And the institution's response to social justice and what they had heard on campus was, we need a center for social justice. And this new center for social justice is going to take over this old space on campus. We're going to retrofit that building. We'll host our student organizations there and speakers, and we'll hire a director of this center for social justice. Yeah, they got it great. And I was like, whoa, 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 let's scale it down. How can we prototype this center for social justice? And I kid you not, this particular group was like, well, our prototype is probably like half a million dollars to do the retrofit of the building and like hire a coordinator. And I was like, no, 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 for less than a hundred dollars. And everyone looked at me like I was, I'd lost my mind. But what we did for this organization was we identified a space in their existing academic building that had a lounge at the corner. We spent $60 on vinyl window clings and made new vinyl window signage that declared this space their center for social justice. We put up all those signage, signs all over the space. We booked out over the course of several months guest speakers in the space, invited student organizations to participate, and ran this as though it were the center for social justice, and then collected feedback on people that were invited to attend events and participated. And the feedback they got was overwhelmingly 
that the institution had totally missed the mark. But this was not what students meant when they said social justice on campus. They didn't look, they weren't looking for another space to hold meetings. They wanted to see dramatic changes in the demographics of faculty. They wanted to see changes in other aspects of the university, not the Center for Social Justice. So in three months and for $60, we learned so much about what the end users really wanted and didn't go down this long, expensive, arduous road only to discover that we were on the wrong, wrong track. And that's why prototyping is so valuable. We are really, we struggle as humans to deliver feedback around ideas that are abstract. If I come up to you on the street and I say, I've got this idea, uh, it's for an electric car that does it, like you lose us. We have a hard time giving you meaningful feedback. But if I can show you something and have you respond to it, suddenly you're gonna find things about it that you wouldn't be able to if I was just describing it to you. I'll give you another example. There was a tire retailer that we worked with. This tire retailer was looking at market trends and said, okay, consumers want more sustainable products, but for us to produce a green tire is going to cost more money. Um, I'm not so sure consumers are gonna to wanna to pay for it. We could survey them and ask them if they'd pay more for it. But what you'll find out is on a survey, people are like, oh, I'll absolutely pay more money for a green tire. But that doesn't always happen in real life. So this company, their innovation group, made a whole display advertising the features of this new green tire. And they did it as close to the spec of the tire they would build if they were going to do a renewable tire. They put these displays in their existing tire stores and, and had sample tires there and ran this whole campaign. When customers came in, if they tried to buy the new green tire and they went up to the counter and they said, hey, I'd really like to buy a pair of these or a set of these, they were told, oh, I'm so sorry, those aren't available yet, but here's a coupon for an existing tire that we do have in stock and they were given a discount. What the company learned through doing this was that overwhelmingly customers were not interested in the higher price sustainable tire, despite the fact that they'd had survey data that said the customers were. And so again, this is where it's really valuable to have something tactile that people can respond to. And you know, I mentioned the cardboard and glue. These things do not have to be overly complex. Um, this can be hand-drawn websites about what they look like, what the content is. We do a lot of storyboarding where you can take a piece of paper and draw four quadrants, you know, vertical, horizontal, and you've got four quadrants and you just write, you draw little stick figures. And you tell what the experience would be. You know, here's Garrett Westlake. He's trying to figure out if this Coke bottle is recyclable. Next frame. He takes a picture of the Coke bottle with his phone and opens the recycling app. Third frame. The recycling app identifies the picture as something that can be recyclable and tells him to put it in the recycling bin. Fourth frame. Garrett finds a recycling bin and puts the Coke bottle in it. Da 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 da. If I show that to you and tell you the story of how the user how the end user, the human in this, is going to respond, you can point out all sorts of opportunities to make it better, where there might be problems and pain points, versus if I just pitch you on this idea and say, oh, there's going to be an app, and it tells you whether or not things are recyclable, um, and you'll do it on your phone, you're going to have all sorts of questions like, uh, does it direct me to the nearest recycling? What does it do if this doesn't work? Like, all of that feedback is so much better when you're able to draw the story, refine the story, and show it over and over again. So obviously, underneath each of these headings is a wealth of other examples and steps and depth, uh, which is why we teach this and really geek out on it. And I'm trying to give you the, the overview. So as part of the prototyping process, you want to solicit feedback. And feedback, like prototyping can get really complicated really fast. And what I appreciate about what we teach around design thinking is keeping a really simple feedback mechanism called, I like, I like, I wonder. So if you ask someone for feedback, you're gonna get someone that goes on for days about something that's totally not related. And how do you find the insight within all this feedback that you're getting? But what we found is if you tell someone, I'd love to know two things you like about this and one thing you wonder about it gets really easy to see trends emerge from that data. Because if everybody says, I like that it's red, that pops up and shows through. And if somebody says, I really wonder about the security of this, that becomes a trend. Whether security is an actual flaw or pain point within the product or service, or whether it's just perceived by the end user, 
it's really helpful to see in that context. And it helps guide people to giving explicit usable feedback for you. So we do a lot of showing prototypes to people and saying, what do you like? What do you wonder? And then using that to distill out insights on how we can iterate the prototypes. Now, you think that this is all fun and games, right? You're Chobani, one minute you're making yogurt, you do these things and magically you're making clothing and bringing in new revenue streams. And wow, if our organization just sat down with people when they got their bills, this would all magically get better. Um, and actually I'm here to tell you that in some ways, the innovation piece is the easy part. So final example before we, before we open this up to questions and, and, and a word of caution. Had a chance to work with a really fun team, innovation team at Mars Candy and Confectionery. I think somebody said that uh, chocolate is what got them through this last little bit. So had a chance to work with the Mars Candy Confectionery Company. There's a whole team that was looking at the future of Skittles, right? I don't know, it's a rough life for some people. Their job is to worry about the future of Skittles. And what they were looking at was market trends that people wanted products that were more personalized. So personalized Skittles. So, you know, maybe Beth likes red Skittles and I like yellow Skittles and we like Skittles in different proportions. And wouldn't it be great as a customer if I got to choose my ratio of Skittles? So the innovation team looked at these market trends, pitched the leadership at Mars and said, you know what we want to do? We want to run an experiment. We want to put in place a prototype in a movie theater back when we could go that says you can use, you can buy Skittles the way that you get frozen yogurt, right? So you get a little cup, you see all the different types of Skittles, you turn the dial, you get your exact ratio of Skittles. If you just want purple, you just, right? So you get all the different Skittles and then you weigh it and then you pay it that way. And we think we can charge people more money for this personalized Skittles experience. Everyone was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Let's do it, da, da, da. And the innovation team went about doing this experiment and they said, great, uh, we just need a bunch of yellows, a bunch of purples, a bunch of reds. Uh, and the leadership was like, oh, uh, well, we can't do that. I'm like, like, what do you mean? We're like Mars Candy and Confectionery. Like, we make Skittles. Like, this is what we do. Like, well, the process for making Skittles is so automatic, right? It's so sy systematized that there's no way to break the supply chain of how Skittles are made. So the team was like, okay, fine, whatever. They just opened large Costco-sized bags, wore gloves, sorted them by hand, dropped them into the canisters, ran this experiment in a couple of movie theaters, sold out immediately. Customer satisfaction through the roof, additional revenue, charge people whatever they want, amazing experiment. There's a reason you haven't seen Skittles for sale this way. It's because they still haven't found a way to change the way that they make Skittles. Leadership at Mars is still saying, but the way we make Skittles is in this ratio. And I don't think we can just go changing that willy-nilly despite the fact that that's what customers wanted. And that is the difference, I think, between an old economy company and a new economy company. Here's a manufacturer that's like, we've been making Skittles this way for hundred, you know, how many, however long, decades at least. We've been making Skittles this way. This is how Skittles are made. And I'll turn the mirror back on higher education for a moment. I see this all the time, right? I think we all talk about, we know that higher education needs to pivot. We need new ways of teaching, new ways of learning that meet a diverse group of students where they are, be they old, young, in our state, out of our state, at home, in a dorm. We all give lip service to innovation, right? The same way Mars was like, we need innovation. Everyone uses the word innovation. We need innovation. And yet we don't really buy into innovation when the rubber hits the road because innovation is hard. It requires changing policies, procedures, ways of doing things, and that makes us very uncomfortable. And so, you know, in this example, I look at higher education and I say, we make higher education the exact same way we make Skittles. It's this many credit hours, uh, you know, assembled in this order. That's the ratio that grants you a four-year degree. The same way that we say, this is the ratio that we make Skittles. And I'm sure you can use your own example of, well, this is how we do it. We can't just go messing with that process despite data and lessons to the contrary. And then know, knowing that we need to be able to pivot if we want to continue to stay relevant or provide the service that we need to provide. So I, not, I say that not to end on a sour note, but just to say that the reason that this, these steps are so important is that being able to use real examples of humans, of end users and their experiences and being able to identify that 
the change that you're recommending your organization make is based on user feedback to specific prototypes and examples is the easiest way to make that pivot or change. Not to say, let's take the whole thing offline, um, let's change this whole thing, but to say, what's the cardboard and glue prototype? And if we can do that with a small number of people and they, and we get it, we get it better and better and better with increasingly large numbers of people, by the time we actually go to do systems change, we are so confident that this change is going to help people in such a clear and decisive way that we can fully advocate for why we need to make that pivot. And I think that is what's really important. Um, and that's what these steps hopefully allow you to do. So again, to recap, using how might we statements when we have first identified challenges, falling in love with the problem and not the solution, looking for those extreme users outside the bell curve to inform and inspire us to come up with alternative solutions, and then identifying those opportunities and solutions through using brainstorming and others, yes and language and constraints, and then selecting a top idea that is audacious, audacious and awe-inspiring and not that's been done before, and then absolutely prototyping that solution or potential solution and collecting feedback in a way that allows us to easily take that feedback and see trends and return to our prototype and iterate upon it and gather more feedback. So there is your crash course Zoom webinar in human-centered design. I tried to throw in some examples for you. Um, I'm happy to, to stop here and, and look and answer any questions. Um, it looks like we already got one uh, question that's thrown in there. How does the idea of not looking around for best practices mesh with the culture of evidence-based approaches? So I don't, that's a great question. Um, I don't think these things are mutually exclusive. I think we can look for best practices. And I think there are certain times and places where we are trying to make, and let me be clear, I think there's a difference between good ideas and innovative ideas. I think good ideas tend to be iterative improvements. Like we're doing something, we wanna do it a little bit better. Um, that's where I think best practices and evidence-based approaches are really helpful. But if you're really looking for innovation, if you're looking to you know, move the needle in a significant way, looking at evidence-based practices and others' best practices um, it is not going to get you to make those huge leaps. Right? They can inform your thinking. They might say like, gosh, there seems to be a, a group of evidence that says you know, if we were to reuse rockets, um, we could save costs tremendously. And look at this other sector where they are reusing this particular resource in their production or in this setting. Um, what if we reused it here? Using it for inspiration is really helpful. But when you're trying to be innovative, um, just using it alone, the evidence-based approaches um, for your sector or area are not the most helpful. Again, great way to have good ideas, make, make improvements to process, absolutely. Um, but not always innovative. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Other questions, folks, feel free to, to drop in the question and answer. Some facilitation tools that can help with design thinking, brainstorming, and prototyping. Um, you know, there's a lot. Um, we've really been using Miro as a technology tool. If you're not familiar with Miro, it allows you to create some sort of like large whiteboard space where you can pin things up um, as, a, as a collaboration tool. Depending on how complicated you are, even some lower tech versions of that, like Google Jamboard, can be really helpful for people adding sticky notes um, and, and adding their ideas and doing those things over time. Um, Again, the brainstorming, I think it's those things around like allowing people the space to do it independently and, and diversity on teams has been shown to make a huge difference. So the more diverse your team is, um, the, the higher the likelihood is that you're going to have these innovative and breakthrough ideas. The more homogenous your team is, the less likely it is to, to actually have breakthroughs. So not necessarily a facilitation tool, but just something to be on the lookout for. Um, Resources uh, to recommend for more human-centered design. So, you know, like I mentioned, the Da Vinci Center, we have a master's degree in product innovation that is heavily based in design thinking. Um, you learn a whole bunch of project management modalities. 
you know, shameless plug here. It is an evening-based program. So if anybody is in Richmond and looking for a master's degree where you walk away with complete mastery of all of this, plus a lot of other tools, um, it is a program, more of an executive style program designed for working professionals, 13 months long. Um, you could still start this fall. So we obviously teach this. We are also about to offer more um, executive education opportunities for this through the Da Vinci Center, through the Corporate Education Office. Um, so we're going to be doing more trainings. We have a couple coming up for healthcare providers. We are going to do some other specialty programs where we actually give you a credential in design thinking. So we actually take you through these steps and you earn a credential in design thinking that you can use in your field. And that's something that you'll see offered through our continuing education office. We've also done um, independent facilitations with specific groups. There's one right now that we're doing that's really fascinating work. We are working with the VCU Police Department to reimagine policing through the use of design thinking. And this has been a really uh, enlightening experience, I think, for all of us. Some of this same conversation around how are you thinking about your end user? Um, and it's been fascinating, right, to like talk through with police officers that they haven't always thought through. And I think this probably shouldn't come as a surprise, but like the customer experience and the journey map of the end user has not always been something that's taken into consideration in policing. And so, you know, this idea of giving the police department these tools to really think about the end user and their perspective and their experience and prototyping and getting feedback from end users is really going to move the needle in some of these spaces. So we do some of that work with individual organizations. Um, a lot of great questions coming in. So give me just a second. Um, are there brainstorming uh, ideas, like most strategies better suited for larger groups, smaller groups? Okay, so um, like all of this, we can go we can go much deeper into brainstorming. What I think works really well is um, having small groups, I would say fewer than 10, can all be working on the same brainstorming topic, right? So our group of 10, we work independently for a couple of minutes, then we come together as a group and we share ideas and we have all of our post-it notes. And then there are four or five other groups all doing it as well. Then we come together and we start to put our post-it notes together by themes. And we say, oh, like our, like, you know, your group, my group, this group, we all came up with a lot of ideas around moving this particular resource to a mobile app and, and, and doing that. Man, that's interesting. Like we all saw this as a huge opportunity space. So um, smaller groups, but then having the opportunity to come together and look for those trends tends to be really helpful. Um, our end users are pitches most vulnerable and marginalized families and individuals. Um, yeah, getting prototype feedback from this audience based on your experience. So I think, you know, if done correctly, I think that one of the great parts about human-centered design is that you have the ability to, to approach individuals to say you want, their, you want their feedback in a very genuine way and that you're trying to design something to better meet their needs and you're not making assumptions about what their needs are. Um, so you're really there. What's great about you know, the bill example I gave was at its most basic level, the exercise was just watching someone go through their bill and then asking them specific questions about like, tell me about you know, how did this make you feel or what would you wanna change? We use a lot of, if I gave you a magic wand, what would you change about this process? Um, and not asking people like, would you want this to be in 12 font or 15 font? Um, but say, you know, if I give you this magic wand, like what's the one thing you would change about this bill? Or what's the one thing you would change about how this service is delivered? And I think if done correctly, you can get in the space where people feel like you're an ally trying to co-create. And, and that's a word we use a lot is like co-creation. So the solutions that you're trying to get to and the insights you gain through working with people are co-creation. And I think it's a more, um, it feels more respectful than just being sort of like sold something and told to use something. So I don't have a, a specific one, but I think that if you can really adopt this human-centered approach, you, you're a listener more than anything. And, and so that, that can be really helpful. Um, what do I think stands in the way of innovation in government? And do you have some good examples of innovation in our sector? I think there is a myth that things can't be done. Um, I think that there's a myth that you can't change some rules. I think there's a myth that things take a long time. I think what we tend to have happen is that we don't come with the right kind of compelling evidence 
and that too often the, the leap is too great. And what I mean by that is we say, here's the problem. If we made this change, we would get this outcome, but the change is like too big for people to wrap their head around. They're like, oh, that, that's too many other organizations, that affects too many other people here, da 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 really micro prototypes where you change small things um, have enormous impact in the long run where you're able to show we interesting like we made this change like I often think about this in terms of like public works right we do these huge civic engineering studies of like what would happen if we did a, a bike lane here and traffic would do this this and the other and I think what we learned during COVID with some of these cities, right? They they did some of these sort of pop-up shutdowns of streets to create more outdoor space for people to walk in urban environments. And I just think like, imagine if you took prototyping to that level where you said, hey, on this particular boulevard, we are just gonna drop cones in and create a bike lane for a week and, and see what happens to traffic, right? If we got our heads around setting up more of these low cost pop-up experiments, um, a lot of these other partner companies run experiments with their products for small user groups to learn this information. And I think in government, we tend to think that it's like an all or nothing game. We either like do it the way we've always done it, or we make this gargantuan shift. And this sort of like rapid prototype um, iterative process is new to us. So I think I've, I've seen, uh, I'll give you a specific example. I know we're short on time, but this is a good example. Um, we ran a process looking at uh, in, in Virginia, there was legislation that was passed that allowed pregnant women uh, access to dental cleanings because there was great medical evidence that receiving a dental cleaning while you were pregnant had tremendous uh, health benefits to mother, child, and actually greatly reduced healthcare costs, right? So Virginia passed leg legislation that makes this available. However, the, the women they were trying to target with this legislation didn't have a dentist. They weren't going to the dentist. And so the use rate was something like 5% of women eligible for this benefit were actually taking advantage of it, right? That doesn't mean it was a bad law. That doesn't mean it was a bad program. There just wasn't the infrastructure. And we had an innovation team work on this that actually flipped the experience. And what they found out the pain point for why people weren't taking advantage was because they didn't have a dentist and they had a hard time with childcare for their existing children and they didn't know where to go and how to get an appointment and how to do this on a schedule that worked for them. So they actually built a platform that texted women who were, who were pregnant from their provider and said, um, you're eligible for a dental cleaning. On what day and time would you like your dental cleaning? And the women had the ability to respond, I want a dental cleaning on April 29th at 2 p.m. And that request went to all the providers within a five mile radius of their address saying, do you have an appointment at this time? Would you like to take this appointment? And then the providers acted on that request, filled the appointment slot, and the woman was sent a response back saying, you've been scheduled for an appointment at your first chosen time of 2 p.m. on 429. Here's the clinic where you're gonna go to get your teeth cleaned. And it made it so much more accessible to the individuals that were looking for that service by making a tweak to how the process was done. Um, and they did that through a lot of listening tours and a lot of prototyping of that application and the texting and like texts were better than postcards, right? Like there was a lot of lot behind that, but that's an example of something within the, the healthcare and government space that I thought was really fascinating that we had a chance to work on. Uh, do you have a Kevin? Absolutely, so great question. Um, so our program is very applied like this, this dentistry one that I just shared was an example of this. Um, organizations bring us uh, opportunities all the time to work on real world problems. Um, we've done this for a lot of nonprofits. We've actually done this for some government agencies as well. So um, feel free to reach out to me as well if you have specific uh, pain points. And then I should add that we are developing a new series of design thinking courses at the graduate level at VCU um, where students will earn a credential across disciplines and part of it will be a practicum. And so what this will look like is, say there's a graduate student getting a master's in social work who's taking design thinking through the Da Vinci Center alongside their social work degree, they're actually gonna be doing some practicum work where they do design thinking with organizations and embed within organizations to help them with prototyping, to help them with brainstorming and can share this knowledge. 
And I'm really excited as we build this core of you know, aspiring you know, professionals across disciplines and sectors that have this design thinking skill that can be embedded with you know, organizations like yours and teams like yours to really help be a catalyst for this work. So feel free to stay in touch and reach out as we continue to build that out. That's launching this fall and we've already got some students registering. So I'm excited to have that as an opportunity in the semesters ahead. I've gotten to questions. If I've missed a question, feel free to, to drop it in the chat again, um, bring it back up to the top. Well, great. Well, thank you all so much for your time this afternoon. I, I really appreciate you all joining for this brown bag. Hopefully it was helpful. Um, feel free to reach out to me you know, via email. Um, I will drop it in the in the chat. Um, feel free to find me on LinkedIn um, and keep a lookout for our students that can do this work for you and also for our master's degree and corporate and executive education programs that we'll offer. So thanks for coming today. Thank you.